Some Filipinos choose to work outside the Philippines with the hope that earning money abroad will solve their financial problems. According to the Philippine Statistics Authority, during the period April to September 2015, out of 10 million Filipinos abroad, there were 2.4 million OFWs. The top destinations for work are Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Hong Kong, Kuwait, Singapore, and Qatar. Meanwhile, laborers and unskilled workers comprise the biggest OFW group, followed by service and shop and market sales workers, plant and machine operators, and trades and related workers. The total remittances sent home by OFWs was estimated at 180.3 billion pesos. This include cash sent home, cash brought home, and remittances in kind. Various academic and policy papers reveal that labor migration and remittances resulting from it are salient national development issues. A recent study points out that the amounts of remittances have increased sharply even faster than the departure of migrant workers. Moreover, remittances provide support to a developing country's shaky balance of payments and fiscal positions. Remittances appear to contribute importantly to lifting households out of poverty and benefit the wider community through multiplier effects of increased spending on consumption or investment. Welcome to the Financial Sense, empowering you to make informed choices and take action to improve your financial well-being. I am Alfredo Pascual. And I'm Elena Pernia. Financial Sense talks about how making sense of money is important for the individual and the country. And I'm Joselito Florendo. Today on the show, we will discuss why some OFWs still struggle financially despite working abroad. Our guest for today is Dr. Stella Kimbo, a commissioner from the Philippine Competition Commission, who has previously served as professor and the department chair of the University of the Philippines School of Economics. Hello and welcome, Dr. Kimbo. Hello, good afternoon. Hi. Our biggest question for today is what do OFWs and their families need to understand financially in relation to working abroad? We can attempt to answer this by looking at different factors related to finance that OFWs experience. But first, what motivates an OFW to leave the country and work abroad? How do they weigh the pros and cons of leaving the country to work elsewhere? There are what we call push and pull factors for migration. So push factors are those um, conditions locally that perhaps people don't like so much, which would push them abroad. Pull factors are those on the other hand, are those things that would be uh, in the destination countries, which are attractive to people, which would motivate people to leave uh, the Philippines. Um, I was looking at the statistics, it would seem that perhaps income is still the greatest pull factor. It would still be the greatest motivator for Filipinos to work abroad. Um, looking at the family income and expenditure survey, yeah. there's a substantial difference in income so for, households, incomes, yeah. for households with and without OFWs. So low incomes uh, in the Philippines will would push, push you. Yeah, and lack work. of jobs, for yes, example, uh -huh, yeah. would push you to go abroad. So the difference is, is quite big. It's something like 60 to 80 percent. And so it's a, it's a big pull factor. Well, what about having a relative abroad? Possibly, because that would um, greatly reduce your transaction costs. Like if you travel to a different country for the first time, Having a relative out there is really uh, very comforting. It reduces relative. a lot of uncertainties. Uh, the information would be provided to you. Of course, shelter could be given to you for free, at least temporarily. Yeah, the relative who got you the job abroad. Yes, also. <laughs> what do OFWs have to spend for before deployment and during their stay in the country where they work? 
So, well, of course, there would be a, a placement fee, which is, I think, something like 13500 um, And then the POEA also allows um, agencies to charge one month's salary. So that's the basic costs. But of course, you need to pay for your ticket. Uh, the, the total cost would, of course, um, vary across destinations. So for example, um, I saw a study that would show that for those working in Taiwan, they would shell out something like 85000 to 150000 initially, which is a, certainly a big amount. Many of the values, I would think and I observe, would go abroad to be able to earn so that they can sustain their families that they would leave behind in the country. And a major dilemma or issue they have to face is how they you know, balance the amount of money they'll spend while they're abroad as OFWs for their living expenses and how much they will remit to their family. Uh, how, do, how do you view this uh, Dilemma. Do you have any information that tells us how OFWs would approach this question? So, so again, um, looking at the family income and expenditure survey, the average amount of remittances is something like 14,000 pesos. So that accounts for the difference um, between the households with and without OFWs. Um, so obviously when an OFW goes abroad, there's, there is an expectation that money will be sent back, right? So, of course, when you get there, um, when you go abroad, then maybe for some workers, uh, they would realize that it's not enough. What they're making is probably not enough. So there's an expectation to send back, but then there are living expenses to deal with. And so um, there are anecdotes um, indicating that many of our OFWs um, go into debt. So that's, um, I guess, one of the, the issues um, that we need to deal with. So if they're in debt, they don't have any savings. So that's um, perhaps the likely situation. The OFWs abroad will have very um, great difficulty saving. But then, if you look at the st statistics as well, um, the households back home, they actually save more. So they are able to save more out of the remittances. In addition, they're actually able to spend more on education. Mm -hmm. They spend more on, on health. Mm -hmm. They spend more on things like furnishing. So in short, there are like some investments mm -hmm. that uh, they make out of remittances. But then the statistics would also show that the households with OFWs spend more on recreation. Yeah. So, uh, so it's a mix of things, right? So whatever remittances they receive, is a, a chunk of it is for human capital investments, mm -hmm. but then they also, I think, have a better quality of life in terms of increased recreation. Is that true for all income groups? Um, this, the increase in savings, yes. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a greater, uh, sa there's a higher savings rate for households with OFWs across all income groups. Uh, across all uh, occupational categories as well? Um, I didn't check. <laughs> <laughs> but then I would <laughs> But generally... Um, would, well, would you say that uh, white-collar OFW families would have greater savings than blue collar. Yeah, I would, I would think so. I yeah, mean, yes. Uh -huh. Why? Well, because of course your lower um, income deciles yes, that would uh -huh. be more or lesser unskilled workers, whereas your um, maybe ninth or tenth income deciles that would yeah. be your your you know yes. your professionals and technical workers. Yeah. And across all of these income groups, you see a higher savings rate for. Yeah. My for observation is that those uh, going to take up uh, blue collar type jobs would normally be provided for their living expenses already or their living requirements, including shelter, you know, and uh, food and, uh, and other uh, living expenses. So there's not much of uh, pressure in terms of keeping part of their uh, earnings with them. So mo the bulk of their earnings, I would think, uh, get remitted to their, their families. Yes. And That's why your statistics show that 80% of 
of the earnings are remitted? Um, is, that, is that the what the data show? I haven't encountered data that would indicate a uh, breakdown. Yeah, the breakdown. Okay. But then um, I would think that it's on the high side. Maybe that, is on that range. Yeah, I mean on that range maybe. Okay. But, but then we ha also have to remember that uh, to be able to cover for your travel costs, replacement fees, and all that, even before leaving, they are likely to take out a loan. So meaning, the first thing that you need to do when you go abroad is pay off your debts, which the statistics would also bear out. Um, households with OFWs have greater expenses on loan payments than those without OFWs. So if investments are being made on human capital, you know, by sending kids to school, and I, I, by observation, you know, I note that they also invest in, uh, in infrastructure, you know, I mean, like homes. Mm -hmm. So we could see an improvement, you know, in the living standards of the family left behind and also a better prospect mm -hmm. for the family because they will now be producing uh, well-trained, well-educated uh, children. Mm -hmm. So there is that uh, positive effect. Yeah, but then again, there's also that slackening effect on the families left behind. You know, with remittances coming on a regular basis, data do show that some uh, families, uh, well, they, uh, well, they slacken in terms of looking for, uh, looking for jobs, doing their studies, you know, and uh, putting the remittances to good use. That's right. You know, there is a social angle to this, which uh, might have to be discussed at some uh, future uh, sessions. But uh, just on the financial aspect, uh, if there is enough coordination between, let's say, this espou the spouse that's abroad and the spouse that's left behind, then uh, the money can be managed in such a way that uh, the earnings are able to prepare the family for a, for a good future. But that's, not, that's an ideal situation, doesn't always happen that way. Oh, which points out that, you know, there must be financial literacy on both right. parts, you know, on the part of the OFW abroad and the OFW family that is left behind. Yeah. Yeah. What do they need to know about savings, yeah. about where to put the money in? Well, I can I, uh, suggest five things. First, I think the OFW and their family members should first know themselves, okay, where they are right now. So they should know the monthly income and monthly expenses. They should know who they owe money to, but also their receivables from other people. So know yourself so that you can live within your means. I think the second one is for the households of uh, OFWs to come up with a financial plan. They should have a target on uh, what they want to be in, in one year, two years, and five years from now. Third, I think they should uh, take into heart the concept of saving, of setting aside a portion of their income uh, monthly. You can start with, let's say, 5% of your monthly income and move uh, upwards from that year on year. And next is I think they should have an idea of investing, the concepts of investing, uh, that they should not limit their savings to an ordinary uh, savings account or a time deposit. They should take a look at other uh, investment instruments as well. And finally, when you invest, I think one should not be greedy as well. Okay? We have heard several uh, instances of people uh, being falling victims to uh, scams. And I forgot one thing. It's very important. It's all about differentiating needs versus wants. You should know uh, what you actually need versus what can be postponed in the meantime. So those are my simple suggestions to OFWs, which they can share and discuss with their uh, family members in the Philippines. In fact, it is said, you know, being rich is not uh, earning more, it's spending less. No. And then we talk of spending, we have to distinguish between spending that's uh, consumed for items that are consumed, so after the expenditure, the money is gone, and spending for the future through investment in education, investment in uh, a home, and uh, investment that uh, will continue to yield 
assets or earnings that will support the family going forward. We must remember that, uh, and I think we have to remind the, the families left behind by OFWs that their father or mother earning money abroad uh, will not be there permanently or for a very long, long time. These are temporary uh, works that um, will last, you know, after a, a certain period of time. So they have to, as uh, uh, Professor Florendo said, you know, have that portion of the earnings uh, invested and not uh, fully spent on consumption so that they can have, uh, you know, a future that will continue to provide them support, either to their own earning because they have studied well or from the returns on investments. And if I may add to your tips, it would also be good for the OFW to understand the necessary spending that they would have to incur when they get there. For example, taxes. Of course, they're exempt from taxes locally in the Philippines, but they're not exempt from taxes abroad where they are. So they need to understand how, how much those tax payments are. Secondly, they will obviously remit. Um, they need to find um, the best way, fastest and cheapest way to remit their money. Um, although most, I think about 62% still rely on banks, but there could be other um, agencies, for example, that might offer a better deal. Third, um, some don't remit cash, but they might want to send in kind. So um, there's a recent law that now exempts uh, balik buy and boxes worth 150000 and below from, from taxes. Um, par parcels, 10000 and below are also exempt from taxes. So those little things um, might, might actually help you uh, in your uh, savings. Yeah. Uh, I see here some statistics that you have about the savings rates of, uh, uh, of OFWs. And having it mentioned a while ago that uh, savings of 5% would be ideal, what is the actual savings rate of uh, OFWs? Okay, so for all... Okay, these are expenditure shares, all right? So savings, uh, how much would savings be in relation to your total expenditures? Okay. Okay, for all income groups, for those with uh, OFWs, households with OFWs, it's it's 17% compared to 8% for those households without OFWs. Um, for the lowest 40% of households, so that's poorest um, four income deciles, it's 4.2% for households with uh, OFWs, and a negative 0.2, so they're slightly deceiving for, for households without OFWs. For um, richer income groups, like the upper 20%, uh, their savings share in ex total expenditure is 24.6% versus 22% for those without OFWs. Uh, I I'm I'm glad for those statistics, but I'm also worried that it will encourage more Filipinos to, to <laughs> not, well, not just to spend, but also to desire to work abroad. Well, um, currently That's the push a big question, yeah, you know? but then maybe the push factors right now might be so big, meaning the lack of jobs, unless that is addressed, um, we cannot tie them down, right? It's also important to keep in mind that it makes a difference what type of jobs are taken by our compatriots, you know, when they go abroad. Because there are certain jobs that uh, they deliver their labor, like domestics, yes. but they don't learn much, you know, uh, anything new that they can bring back to the country. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe when they come back, they become better uh, caretakers. Well. There's so many good caretakers in the Philippines already. But, you know, if we are to send our uh, OFWs and they take on uh, technical jobs mm -hmm. or highly skilled uh, assignments abroad, then there is also the knowledge and skills that they're able to bring back, you know, aside from uh, being able to remit the, their earnings to their family share, they also, when they come back, bring back uh, those skills mm -hmm and the uh, knowledge, you know. It might also be good to find out what the savings rate 
uh, would be for the OFWs themselves because these are household respondents. So these are the households that get, got left behind by the OFWs. We don't know what's happening to the OFWs themselves. They could be in great debt, right? Um, but then, so that also needs to be monitored. So yeah. that's an area of study. There's no study yet huh? yeah. that uh, will tell us what are the savings yeah. made by these OFWs themselves. Yeah, we could just speculate, you know. Yeah. Because we hear a lot of uh, stories of OFWs coming back, expecting that they'll be coming back to a family that's already, you know, established yeah. with a good home, you know, with children, well-educated, but sometimes it's a... Yeah. Because they, they've sent all their earnings here. Right. You know? so, so one way to look at it is that um, the OFW, uh, well, it's probably not increased income that is the biggest gain, but rather increased liquidity. So when they get there, um, there's actually access to, to more loans. Their, their um, employment now becomes collateral for loans. They're actually able to send um, cash to their family so that locally um, the, the households actually become more liquid and they're actually able to save more out of it. On that note, are there any loans related to migrating abroad? If so, what are they? Uh, like I have no fees. idea. <laughs> yeah, normally, you know, my personal experience, you know, I've been approached by yeah. people or people who work for me, like drivers okay. and maids, you know, and their relatives going Informal abroad. Credit. And yes. then they have yes. to borrow money so that uh, their relative can pay the placement fee. Yeah. Okay, and I, I've heard of figures like 20,000 at least, you know, yeah. Yeah. to be paid for one person to go abroad. You know? yeah. So right there, at the start, the OFW is already indebted. You know, that has to be paid for first. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it's paid for first. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's an obligation that has to be taken care of. And the statistics would also show that um, households with OFWs actually give out more loans. So meaning it also... To extended family. To extended family, yeah. perhaps neighbors, maybe it could be that uh, so it having, charts. yeah, I mean, having an OFW in your family might be a signal to the neighbors that oh, they're probably, yeah. you know, uh, more they're more liquid. They're probably a source of, of cash. Yeah. So well, from anecdotal uh, evidence, I, I would say that uh, when you go to a community, which is a, a normally an impoverished community, and there is one house or a couple of houses that are well-built, beautiful. Normally they'll say, you know, that's the family of an OFW. They would say that that's common, well. you know? Yes, yes. Common observation. Yeah. yeah, in fact, in some communities, you know, where you have a white painted house with a blue roof, you know, is, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, well, you know, uh, in some communities in Bohol, you know, they mm -hmm. are the seafarers, you know, yes. and, uh, you know, the white painted house with the blue roof will be in a few years more than one in that community because there are more than one, you know, seafarer in that community. I, I guess that's the pull factor. Yes. You know, uh, you know, knowing a person who gets you a job, you know, in the same profession where you are abroad. Uh, but, but moving on, uh, what do these, uh, uh, OFW families need to understand about the care of uh, the properties that they have? Well, I think one key challenge is making sure that they're able to legally own, you know, the property. They have to be advised as well, you know, that uh, acquiring a real estate property is not just occupying it. Mm -hmm. You need to have the title okay. to the land. You know, that's very important, you know, and that they're able to pay the, the real estate taxes mm -hmm. because after, I don't know, five years, you know, and you're are not up to date with your taxes, the government will auction off your property. You know? mm -hmm. Whose responsibility should it be to educate the OFW families left behind, you know, on these financial matters? Well, I understand that we give uh, financial literacy seminars to those who are living abroad. I don't know whether it's done universally or everybody goes through it. I think that should be done also. This kind of uh, financial literacy seminar should be given also to those who are left behind. By POEA? POEA, yeah, can sponsor that because uh, 
you know, the herbs of Ayush are there for the family shear. You know. And um, the last law that was passed in the last Congress, the 16th Congress, was actually um, a law declaring the second week of November as the Economics and Financial Literacy Week. So for the first time, we have a whole week of financial literacy activities and the lead agency is NEDA oh, okay, and then okay. um, the partner would be BSP because BSP yes. is actually working on financial yeah, literacy. Technical knowledge. Yes, and its yeah. private partner is the Philippine Economic Society. Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, so that's uh, a good venue actually for uh, literacy activities. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose also that the Philippine embassies abroad mm -hmm. should do the same for the OFWs who are deployed there, you know, particularly when it comes to protecting assets and other properties of the OFW. You know, one, as, one financial aspect of uh, these remittances from OFWs is uh, the fact that through these remittances, the country itself as a whole gains by way of the foreign exchange that's generated. You know, remember, these remittances are exchanged for pesos. It's pesos that's spent here. But the whole economy gains that foreign exchange and that's able to sustain mm -hmm. our importation of all types of goods, including uh, capital goods and uh, consumption goods. You know? uh, otherwise, you know, ec we need the uh, export to earn that much. Mm -hmm. Beauty with this kind of uh, earnings is that uh, for the country that these remittances don't need to be repaid, you know, the foreign exchange don't need to get repaid. There uh, are such uh, economic values, you know, oh, also sure at, at the macro level. Internationally, the Philippines rates third as a remittance recipient country after India and China. And remember, India and China are Already. ten times bigger. Yes, exactly, and than uh, the Philippines. Yeah, uh -uh. yeah and. Uh, our gains from uh, remittances are 10% of GDP. So it's really, you know, th that's why they are really called the, uh, yeah, the, uh, I mean, heroes of the country, uh, you know, the OFW yeah. as the Bayani. And if you hear all of these um, anecdotes, they're also the Bayani of their own families. Yes. Yeah, because it's yes. a really a big personal sacrifice to actually leave your yeah. family behind. In fact, um, maybe that's, that's probably one of the push factors. If you're unmarried, there's a greater likelihood for you to actually go and mm -hmm. work as a... Yeah. yeah, if you have children to feed. Well, married, unmarried, I guess, uh, you know, the or push factors. Or if you're factors. unmarried and you have uh, hmm. siblings and parents yes, to yeah. take care of, you know, there's yeah. also a push yeah. factor. Yeah. Well, I think the types of jobs that are being uh, taken by all the values uh, is changing, you know. Uh, to those where families, whole families can go abroad, you know, with the main uh, breadwinner, okay, like uh, technical experts, mm -hmm. and they are recruited. It's not on a single status anymore, you know, they can bring their family. Uh, I think that kind of uh, overseas work, you know, might be, might definitely better, you know, than one where the individual goes on a, on a single status. Mm -hmm. And the proportion of uh, this uh, high, what, what you call uh, white collar type job mm -hmm. uh, is increasing, I think, as uh, we produce more uh, educated graduates, you know. But of course, we want to keep these uh, experts as well in the country. So there's a big dilemma for us yeah, in the, brain, the country. Uh, the brain and the broad drain. Yeah, but I, I, I would not, you know, I would look at this uh, more of uh, brain circulation rather than brain drain. You know, we send them there, they imbibe new knowledge and, and develop new skills, and then they come back and you help the development of the country. We've seen that, you know. In, the, in, in countries uh, around us that have developed with the return of their uh, compatriots abroad, from abroad. I, I wonder though whether in some uh, occupations there is an intergenerational uh, continuation of uh, OFW aspirations. Yeah, seafarers, yeah. Where uh, a father seafarer will tell a son to take up marine engineering so that eventually... But upgrading. 
Well, we the, don't the talk about upgrading, yes, yeah, but you know, it becomes, you know, uh, like the main industry, you know, of the family, mm. you know, seafaring as, uh, you know, as a main OFW job. The statistics would show that uh, there seems to be that kind of an possible intergenerational effect. Um, there's an average of 1.13 OFWs in households with OFWs. So in short, there are some households yes, with two. Yes, uh, yeah. so, so there's a tendency. So we don't, we don't know if those are, uh, well, they're married. They could be the husband, and, husband wife. and wife, or it could be a parent and a, an offspring. Yeah. Yes. Or mother and daughter. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But I, I guess it depends on whether the experience was actually positive for, for the parent, in which case the, the children might follow their footsteps. But just going back to the saving statistics, yes, 17% is high compared to the overall savings rate of the country, but 17 or even 24% I mean, these are numbers that are lower than 30 or more percent savings rate of other developing countries that have or are developing faster than the Philippines. So we still have to really exert more effort to promote savings in the country. I guess if there are 10 million OFWs abroad, there would be 10 million OFW families here. And if each family saves at a rate of 4%, then our banks must be in good business. Banking uh, or banks, because they have now done or handled most of the remittances. No, from the savings, not not from uh, income, from mm, uh, mm. yeah, but on on savings. Yeah, yeah. I think there are statistics from the BSP that would indicate that I think eighty percent of those um, actually have accounts. Savings accounts, are whereas in general, only two out of ten Filipinos have an account. So, for those with OFWs, they're pretty good. Yeah. So, but this wouldn't be the rural banks. This would be the large, uh, the larger banks. Well, it depends on uh, accessibility, you know, of uh, the bank to the family of the OFWs. So, yeah. I, I would think that if they come from all the areas of the country, mm -hmm. you know, then uh, the banks in those areas. Mm -hmm. Should be, yeah, yeah everybody, everybody, I think, all, all the banks uh, get into the fray and they all benefit. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Kimbo. Uh, I, it was a pleasant discussion. You know, uh, some statistics that you shared with us are actually new to us. So thank you very much for being here and sharing us this information. Do you have any final words to share with us and with the audience? Yeah, I think from a household's perspective, there are clearly economic gains from having an OFW in the family. Um, but then, of course, that's very micro and very um, present-oriented. Of course, um, from a macro perspective, you would, of course, want um, a better situation for the entire country. You know, you would want to aspire for a situation where there are enough jobs locally so that parents don't have to leave their, their kids behind. Um, so that's one. It has always been uh, repeated that, you know, we need to actually create jobs locally. But then perhaps um, just thinking about the, st the statistics, one possible policy handle as well would be um, improving access to credit locally. Because if, um, in fact, lower income households have access to loans that they can actually use to send their kids to school, then perhaps um, that might be a better option for some. Mm -hmm. So we should look at all um, other alternatives. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, OFWs have contributed much to their families, their communities, and to the country as a whole. In fact, government has facilitated their deployment over the years, acting as some sort of employment agency. However, for greater inclusive growth, this policy of deployment should be rethought so that families get to stay together and spend their savings together. During the course of our discussion, the importance and contribution of OFWs has been emphasized. Therefore, I think financial education is very important before the OFW leaves the country. This should be a shared responsibility 
between the OFW and the members of his or her household. Once again, I would like to emphasize that the OFW and his relatives should first know themselves, know their current status. Second, they should come up with a financial plan to determine where they want their financial status to be within one, two, or five years from now. Third, they should be able to differentiate needs versus wants. Kinakailangan malaman ang pagkakaiba ng luho at pangangailangan. It is also important that the OFW and the members of his household make saving a daily part of their lives. And they should also be aware of other investment products like uh, beyond a time deposit and savings accounts. And as they invest and save, my last advice is that they don't be greedy and that they take care of uh, being victims or falling prey to scams. Thank you. OFWs are driven to jobs abroad by dreams. Dreams of a better life now and in the future. The realization of these dreams depends heavily on their being able to manage their finances well. So I hope that the discussions we had today will somehow give ideas that will help our OFWs and their families handle the current earnings so that they can enjoy this now and in the future. These OFWs are called modern-day heroes as their remittances have largely contributed to the growth of the Philippine economy over the years. However, why do some OFWs still struggle financially despite working abroad?